All right, Randall, it's good to see you again. We're looking forward to doing a couple trips with you this year. We got the Scablands and the Gorge coming up, but since the eclipse is so close, Darren, Darren is especially, he's he loves this celestial mechanics stuff. So yeah, I we'd, uh, we'd chat with you about celestial mechanics and the moon and the sun and all that. So thanks uh, for coming back on. How's it going? It's going quite well. I've been on the road for a few days, so I'm a little bit shy on my sleep quota. So if I do nod off in the middle of our conversation, it's not because you guys are have bored me to death. It's <laughs> just that... Um, yeah, I'm Darren's still... uh, Darren's low on sleep too, so I'll I'll just I'll keep it, us going tonight here. <laughs> okay, so Darren and I, we can if we take a break. Yeah, hey man, I might only we need twenty. Could, we could p- put this out as as an art piece. You know, Randall <laughs> and Darren sleeping for thirty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Graham trying to wing it all by himself. So where Maybe do you want to juggle. start, Darren? Darren, you're well, the one that sort of, you know, saw yeah, some of this stuff before, yeah, and then you want to talk about it. Darren, what? Um, so there's this. Well, I, I, there's this eclipse coming up. There's this eclipse coming up, and the thing that we always kind of, and it's the other thing we should mention is that we just noticed right before we started is it's been almost it'll be ten years this August since our very first podcast. With uh, Randall, we went three and a half hours, episode 65, if people want to go check that out. But that's when we first chatted with you. You mentioned you were coming to Canada, and we ended up hanging out when you did. And, you know, we've been doing these events together and everything ever since. Yeah. And we, we always kind of talk about this weird sort of thing with the solar system, and that's where I want to start. And it's, I, I don't know if I've got it exactly right, but it's something to do with 108 or 109 uh, moon diameters between the moon and the earth and it's the same amount of earth diameters between the moon and the sun and um, with the eclipse coming up i've been thinking about it and i've never quite been able to articulate it as well as, as i'd like so i was hoping to go back and touch on some of that stuff because it's always good i mean well, probably, I don't want to spoil it right away, but it kind of, it points to some things that are pretty apparent, in my opinion, anyway. There's kind of two different ways it can go, um, you know, one of which being intelligence design and the other one being some sort of rule-based system that might be more magnetic or electric-based than what we're told. Hmm. Well, you mentioned the, the 108 principle, which is always fascinated me because you know back when was it in 1972 i decided since i cleaned up my act and i wasn't doing any dope anymore for a while and then uh, i thought well you know what i still want to do something to get high so i'm going to learn how to meditate so i turned out i had a I, i found this brahmin priest who was a student of a Himalayan Swami, and he was teaching meditation. So I went in there, and they had this whole system of meditation going back. This guy, the Himalayan Swami, he was uh, from the mid, from the Himalayas. And uh, let me show you his picture here. I think I got his picture. Well, I did have it right here. Uh, if I don't have it, we won't worry about it now. But he was a pretty cool dude. Uh, anyway, so... I got initiated into this system of meditation. I was just going to joke that you were initiated into it, but yeah, I guess you really were. No, I really was. Um, <laughs> I went through it was a whole ceremony and uh, pretty interesting and pretty involved. Um, so as part of that for my meditation, I got a set of meditation beads, mala beads, right? And on the mala beads, there are 108 beads on the string and one of them is larger and slightly in like a different shape than uh, than the rest of them right and god darn it i should if i i didn't think of this i could have had this ready and set up to go i could actually have showed my beads are somewhere i still have them to this day so that's you know when did i say 1972 71 it was 71 i was initiated in this form of meditation in 1971 so i got these beads and what it is is that you used these two fingers here thumb and what do you call this finger the middle one oh the, your ring finger. ring finger yeah. 
That finger has a name, right? Ring finger, your ring finger. Ring finger, of course, yeah. So you've got this set of beads and and, and you're holding it. It's going through your ring finger. And then you do, it's about coordinating your breath with a mantra. And you guys certainly know what a mantra is, right? Yep. It's a little formula that you internally say to yourself. It helps, it calms your mind and you focus on that because the idea of the meditation is you're trying to get beyond this incessant mental activity that's always going on in your brain and sort of like, you know, still the, the conscious mind because only when you still the conscious mind do you then click into the unconscious mind, right? And then you discover that the conscious mind is only a small speck within the unconscious mind. And, um, but the, the, how that relates here is that when you've got those beads, you start out, you've got a, you're holding it so that the, that the bigger, the larger bead is between these two fingers. And then you repeat your mantra. So, uh, so my mantra was seven syllables, and I've never, ever spoken it aloud, not once. But you correlate that with your breath. You do the repetition of the mantra, and with each repetition of the mantra, you roll one bead with your, with your index finger. So then, as you go through the whole beads you know that you've completed a round, a meditation round, when you come back to that big B to get yeah. you've done 108 repetitions. Yeah. And so then what's happening is you're coordinating your breath. And then in the advanced stages, you're actually coordinating it with your heartbeat. And I was only really just getting the hang of that when I kind of got sidetracked into the 70s. Did you get did you get to pick yourself a new name like Ram Carl or something like that? Or like, what would your new name be? Uh, well, my new name was given to me by Swami Rama. Was it? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mahajiva. Mahajiva? Mahajiva. Nice. Yeah. You know what that means? Maha oh. was great. Jiva's life force. Great life force. The great life force. Nice. I believe it. Mm-hmm. So 108. Okay. So let's, let's bring this back in. So. I have, I've had this number 108 had been impressed into my seven layers of consciousness for years, right? 108. And then I began to discover how important 108 was in sacred architecture. It shows up in all of these different places. And then that there's a whole set of frequencies based upon the number eight, you know, 100 twice. 108 is 216, and twice 216 is 432, and 432 seems to be like a core number. Um, what is it? Is it G in the octave? I think cycles per second is is the note G, 432 cycles per second. And then, uh, but the, uh, what is that, the, in the diatonic scale? I'm not a musician, but... Uh, I've never studied musical theory, but I think that's in the diatonic scale. And then the scale that we've shifted to is the 440 cycles per second, right? Yeah, there was the 432, right? 432 to 440. Yeah, that's what, yeah, exactly. So the 432, uh, one fourth of that is 108. So it's in that same frequency. It's a the octave, the like same a, octave, right? Yeah, a sub multiple of 432, and 432 seems to be the base frequency of the whole system. And you find it embedded in all of these different numbers or different systems, right? If you remember, I'm sure, uh, Graham, that you're familiar somewhat with uh, the Vedas, and you a know, bit. yep, yeah, well, you know, the the the, the yugas, right? The yugas, yep. the, the so the the base of the system it's it's basically the same system as the kabbalistic tetractus which is a which is a, a sort of a it's a triangle with uh that goes one and then it doubles and then three and then four right so you got four plus three which is seven plus two which is nine plus one, which is 10. So the tetractus makes up this 10 and each point on that is then associated with one of the 10 sephiro on the Kabbalistic tree of life. Um, 
but in any case, <clears throat> it it has the same the 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 Kali the Yugas has the same structure as the Tetractus going. Uh, so 432 doubles to 864. It triples to uh, 1,296,000 years, and then it quadruples. Is that it to uh, to uh, 1,728,000 years? But then the, then they add up. When you add them up, you get 4,320,000. So now you're on a you've gone up like a higher. Um, you basically added some zeros at the end. But then you come like to the Sumerian king lists, which I ought to should ought to should have this pulled up and we could look at it. But the um, Sumerian king lists uh, st- end when you take the ten kings. So there's this correlation now between the ten sephiro on the tree of life, the ten <coughs> the ten points on the tetractus, and the ten kings of Sumeria. And then each of those reigns of the 10 kings of these legendary kings is one of those sacred numbers within that canon of cosmic numerology, if you want. But when you add them all together, you get 432,000, which to me is interesting. 432,000, you you go through, work your way through the king lists, you take that summation, and that total then now is the same number of years as the number of years in the Kali Yuga. And it's, so it's almost as if you take those numbers of the king lists, the Sumerian king lists as a system, the Yugas is just a continuation of that, except on, a, I guess you could say, a higher frequency, because now you're going from 432 up to 4,320,000. Then you get to the other interesting thing, which was a much more recent discovery for me, which, well, I say much more recent, but probably, you know, in sometime in maybe the late 80s, when I was really digging down and trying to uh, get, okay, so what's the deal with Khufu's pyramid anyway? So I started looking at all the stuff. And the one thing I kind of honed in on that I felt was really pretty impressive but um, that could also be confirmed was that it was a model of the Northern Hemisphere on a scaling ratio of 43,200 to 1. So if you were to take the Khufu's Pyramid as it is now with its height of uh, right about 482 feet, the length of its base, and there's two ways, remember, there's two ways to have measured the base. You have this, using the stones that are there now, you got 755 feet. each side's a little different, um, so it's not exactly the same on every side length. But then there were sockets on these casing stones where it's much closer to 760 feet, right? So you, you had two ways. You had the, the pyramid sitting on the sokol, which was this flat base, and then you had these reveted casing stones. I don't know if you guys you have been there to the Khufu's Pyramid? Yep, yep. Okay, do you remember at least on the two of the corners, you can still see the slots where those cornerstones were placed? Yep. You can still see those slots. I've got photographs of them. If we take a break, I'd, I'd be happy to pull that up. Uh, but anyways, so you can you could then, if you, if you take the, the Khufu's Pyramid at present, and not, you've got to basically create the, complete the triangle, Right. So now you increase that, enlarge it by 43,200 times, and then the square base of the pyramid would be the same dimension, the same measure as the circular equator of the Earth. So that 43,200 scaling ratio actually shows that the Great Pyramid, Khufu's Pyramid, is like a solution of the squaring of the circle. And the height of the pyramid is now the height of the Earth's polar radius. Oh, wow. So, and, and I mean, I'm talking about very, very close, like within a few dozen or, or maybe 100 or 200 feet maximum. The problem is, is that the Earth itself is not a perfectly rigid body, but it has a little bit of give to it, a little bit of plasticity to it, so or elasticity to it. So... 
you know, if you measure the earth to that kind of precision to where you're measuring uh, a, a, an axis of the earth within a few feet, you're going to be lucky to get the same exact number every time because things are moving. I mean, think about just a big earthquake. You might have yeah. a whole section of the tectonic plate that shifts up or down by six, eight, ten feet. So the point is that I'm getting at is within a very, very small margin of error, you are literally, you, you can say that, yeah, the, um, the, the pyramid is on a, is a model of the Northern hemisphere. I guess you could flip it upside down and you'd have a model of the Southern hemisphere, but it's a model of the, one of the hemispheres of the earth, um, at a scale of 43,200 to one. So coming back to, you know, 108 is, you know, is part of that, that system, 108, 216 and 216 and, uh, uh, then you double that and then you get your 432. Now, somewhere, let's see, when I'm trying to think back, when this, when this, I realized this, because I was always playing with dimensions of the solar system and discovered how, you know, I would say, I guess by the 90s, early 90s, I had done enough exploration that I realized that with just slight adjustments, pretty much the whole solar system could fall into alignment and be described uh both in terms of distances but also in terms of time the same set of sacred numbers now one of the the major discrepancies between the sacred number which would be 360 and the earth is 365.25 but you know you can you can actually calculate how how much of a mistake it is by going 365 divide by 360 and uh, flipping that. So that's, it's 0.986% pro, uh, accurate. Now, the rest of the, so at least the visible solar system, that's the greatest discrepancy right there between in the Earth uh, orbital system. In that, in the idealized calendar, and there was an idealized calendar of old, All you probably know this too, that there were many ancient calendars that ran a 360 day sacred year. I mean, we, we get our, if I could pull off my old geometry book here from the 1930s, geometry for the practical man, it opened the word geometry start. Well, it started with the Sumerians. How did they decide on the 360 degree division of a circle? Well, because they once they believed that once the earth's orbit around the sun was 360 days. So think how nice that would work out if we had a, if, if, so something, what's a little off, okay, is that uh, the orbit is a little bit too big, so it takes five and a quarter days extra longer, is it that this uh, axis, the rotation on its axis is a little faster, if you just, you could tune that thing a little bit, tune the Earth-Sun rotational orbital system just a little bit, and then now you got this nice, precise 360 to one. Every day would be one degree uh, transit or one degree mo motion along the ecliptic. One orbit of the Earth, one, uh, one rotation. That's the di important difference here. Rotation applies to a, a, a body uh, turning around with respect to a, a, a point, an axial point within the system and revolution is outside. So the Earth rotates on its axis, but revolves around the sun. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. If you want to get technical. Okay, so the Earth, so then what you would have is you would have a perfect synchronicity between rotation on its axis and its revolution about the sun. But according to some traditions, and again, I didn't sit down here prepared with, with my footnotes and stuff and my references, um, but in some traditions, that shift occurred as a result of a catastrophe. I was just going to ask about a pole shift maybe back then or something. Some, some, was something like that, yes. And I've gotten a little vague um, on the exactness of all the traditions, but that's the general idea. And anybody who wants to research can go into that. And, and I am going to be covering that. I have covered it in a lot of lectures in the past. Um, 
But so the point is it's a little off. But And then you can do the same thing with the other planets between Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Uh, as I recall, the outer, big outer gas giants were a little off. I mean, Jupiter and Saturn are turn out to be very, very close. I mean, you could, you, I bet you could do it here right now. If you took, um, it, so Jupiter takes just a little less than 12 years to make its rotation around, right? It's 11 point something. Who, who's our, who's the fact checker on this? I'm the fact checker. Okay. Uh, orbital period of Jupiter. We want the orbital period of Jupiter and I'll show you the, we'll make this adjustment and, and you'll see, um, the number, unless you're looking for it, you're going to miss the number. It's 11.86 years. Okay, so 11, there we go. I should know that by now, years. Okay, so now 11.86, and we'll go uh, years. So let's turn that into Earth days. So I'm going to go times. 4,330.6 Earth days. Okay, say that again, and I'm going to write that down. Four three three zero point six. Four three three zero point six. Okay, so good, good. Okay, so check this out. And I'm going to put in four three three, uh, four three three zero point six, and then I'm going to divide by four three two zero, and what I'm going to find is that. It's there's my calculator. You can see there. You can. Uh, it's ninety nine, ninety nine point seven degrees accurate. Wow. So, so then, okay. So if I subtracted that from one minus one, that means that if you were to adjust the orbit, sh shorten its length by point zero zero two. You would now have that the Jovian orbit is four thousand three hundred and twenty Earth Earth days. Holy so, shit! So yeah. that could be like a rounding error. Yeah, I mean, look. Here's the analogy I use: when I build a house, it starts first of a kind, and I built many houses, and I've designed many houses, and we've built those houses or other you know, uh, other things, barns, uh, other weird buildings, um, storage buildings, whatever, but I'm going to use the house. The house is such is, it's also, it, it's a real thing. And it's also a pretty, uh, interesting metaphor. But so when you build a house, okay, if I'm going to build out, somebody comes to me and I want a house and I've got this much property and you know, here's my, I, I say, well, that's the first thing. Let's start with the site. We want the site because even if you're not trying to do anything cool and cosmic, you still want to orient and know your, the orientation of your house. And too bad that so many builders have pay no attention to that, although we're, we're getting back to that. When people are learning, yeah, you can orient your house, for example, to the sun, and you can take advantage of that. You know, you can, you can, and that's the one place that I am a believer in solar energy is in incorporating the energy of the sun is when you build a house. You know, you should be cognizant of the environment. You should be aware of the terrain. What's the, how does the water move over the terrain? You should be aware of, you know, what is the, the soil, the composition of the soil? How thick is the soil? Where's the water table? You also want to know oriented on the site. Where is the sun going to rise? Where is it going to set, et cetera? Those, all those kind of things. You take that into account when you're forming this conception in your mind. So now it starts with a conception. And then what do you do? Well, in the old days, it went from mental, a, a model in your brain, a mental conception to a set of blueprints, a set of working plans, right? Now, what you're doing is you're translating your thoughts into an idealized form under those blueprints. You put down like I would do, and, and most good builders will have typically will work to like eighths of an inch when you're out if you're out framing house now you guys you guys use imperial or met you guys use metric we use both we both. use both i mean i'm an iron worker so we do like half inches you know it's within a half inch yeah within a half inch. okay good yeah. so you're, that's the imperial I, inches feet yards all that okay that's imperial that's that's 
what I'm talking about in in uh, um. So let's see. I lost my train of thought. So you put it out on paper. You're trying to yeah. idealize it. Yeah. Yeah. So now you translate from the paper. Okay, so I was going to add in that I don't. I used to draw plans by hand in the old days. Yeah. I don't do that anymore. I haven't I'll done that. Out, of course, yeah. At least 10, 15 years now. Now I build digital models. Yeah. And, of course, those digital models can be extremely precise. You might put exact numbers yeah. into those digital models. And I can program it where I'm like, to. A, there's no point in programming it to a thousandth of an inch. That would be meaningless in, in, in a building house. So what I do is I set it up to a 16th. So if I divide one by 16, that's 0 0.0625. So I'll have, I'll set it up so it's accurate within 0 0.0625 of an inch. Right. And I, because I know that in the field, we ain't even working that precise. Yeah. You know, typically our, our steel tapes, we've got is the, our smallest unit on a steel tape, a measuring tape is 1 16th of an inch. Yeah. But when you're framing a house, you don't do the same degree of precision as if you're building a fine piece of furniture, right? So, yeah, yeah so you kind of have to determine, okay, what's my allowable margin of error? Now, the difference between the idealized model and the actual structure when it's finished, its accuracy is really a, a measure of the level of craftsmanship. Really good craftsmen like my team are top notch. So we can lay out a, a house that's, you know, 50 feet wide and it will be accurate. When you run those diagonals from one side to the other, it'll be, it'll be accurate within, within an eighth of an inch, which is that would be one, which would be a 1.25% 1. 1. margin error. Yeah, so one divided by eight is, yeah, 0.125 inch. 0.125, yeah, 0 0.125. 0 0.125, right. So, well, okay, so here's the point that I'm getting at that I'm that I'm making here. The way I've come to conceive it is this. When we look at the, the universe, when we look at the real, the, 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 the world of time and space, we're looking at something that has been rendered in matter in the material realm based upon a template. And in that translation from the template, the idealized perfection of the template rendered into a real world structure or system of time and space, there's going to be discrepancies, right? So we just learned that including there's including in our ability to measure them, even including in our ability to measure them, even. And of course, our ability to measure is getting better all the time. But if you've ever studied calculus, you know that the that the basic idea, the fundamental idea of calculus is that of a limit. And a limit is something which you can determine with a degree of precision, but like, for example, if you're trying to find a, a, a line that's tangent to a hyperbolic curve, it's only going to be one point. But how close do you want now? I could say a hyperbolic or an elliptical curve because all planets and they're all basically all orbits are ellipses of a greater or lesser degree of eccentricity. We don't find any orbits that are perfect circles, right? Just like when we look at the getting back to the moon, we go, we have the perigee and the apogee. The perigee is the closest. And you can fact check me on this. I think perigee, uh, Darren, we're looking at about 221,000 miles. And at apogee, I think we're looking at about 252,000 miles. That the, That is the difference between the moon's closest and the moon's furthest distance from the earth. Mm -hmm. I think that is it close to 200? Is its perigee close to 221? Oh, boy. I'm, <laughs> well, well, I'm back checking. I'm looking well, at Darren, Well, Darren so, looks at that. So yeah. while Darren is looking at that, yeah. I, I want to I got a like I want to bring something up quickly because I, I'll never forget when Darren asked you a question. It's had me thinking about this ever since when on our earlier podcasts, 
does that template that you talk about, like, is that unique for each solar system? You know, it, it seems to be like built into this, our solar system, maybe only, and the other, another system way over there has a completely different template. Well, given this, okay, the, the, the positions, the architecture of the solar system is, is appearing it's, to me like it's w whatever, it's optimum for the generation and evolution of higher sentient life. Because, for example, I think the if you look in the, 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 the models of exobiology, and I definitely leave, lean in that direction, I think the evidence is becoming overwhelming that Earth, that life was actually, the precursors to life anyway, were introduced from outside yeah. into the Earth system at the appropriate time when the temperature and the ratio of water to land and all of these other factors are optimum, life is seeded. Now, of course, that gets us into the question of that we won't necessarily get to here, whether like, uh, you know, the theory of panspermia, that life is seeded, for example, throughout the universe. And I think there's some interesting new research along those lines showing the importance of organized plasmoid systems in that um, being actually the, the way that these microscopic precursors of life could be channeled th through space. But then there's also the possibility, the probability of things like comets, even asteroids, having the raw materials of life being de delivered to Earth. Now, right. after the creation of the solar system, and however that occurs, you know, if you take the nebular hypothesis, you have the sun consolidating as the, the, the center of the system, the center of mass of the whole system. And then all of the outer planets are, you know, are, are gravitationally cohering based upon their distance from the sun. And I mean, there's so many mysteries and it's so complicated. I'm not going to even attempt to get into that explaining the, the origin of the angular momentum of the solar system, okay, is, uh, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a mystery. I don't think anybody's really solved that, why everything is spinning, and it's spinning in the same direction, right? And uh, it, rotating and spinning, rotating and revolving in the same direction, you know. The, except the, the, Venus. the moon? What? Except Venus? Except, well, Venus is revolving in the same direction but it's rotating in the opposite direction and damn it i wish i had my i hear i am totally unprepared if i don't i have <laughs> when i've got a globe i could i can demonstrate this but i'll try to demonstrate it anyway uh, well before you do that the uh so in 2021 the closest perigee on december 4th was 221,702 miles and the apogee on May 11th was 252,595 miles. Okay, so I was close enough. You were close enough, yep. 221 to 252. Okay. So that, that's a measure, that difference is a measure of the ellipticity, the eccentricity of the, of the moon's elliptical orbit. But so, like I've got this, this let's say this is the Earth's axis or any, any rotating body, and let's say it's rotating uh, like this, Okay, then what happens is, is if I flip it over, turn it upside down, now it's going to be rotating in the opposite direction. Uh. So, otherwise, uh, how, how else do you explain the fact that Venus is rotating? I, I, to me, that just something caused Venus to flip over physically on its axis. Well, isn't the moon in a unique position to not be spinning as well? Then, I mean, it's wrote, it's going around but not spinning. Okay, now let's get let's clarify that. So, hold that thought. Yeah. Let me complete the other thought, which is that the and, and you raise an interesting question: Does that template, as it stands now, hold only for our own solar system, or others? And I would say here, and of course, it's totally speculative. I would say that, yes, if you want to introduce life and then see and then prompt that life to evolve to a higher level of self-awareness and consciousness, 
you probably need to use that, be working from that template. Um, we could do the same thing like with Saturn, Jupiter, Saturn, right? Show that Saturn is within an extremely close and you could do the calculation on your own or we could, we could do it here after the break. We saw how close Jupiter was in that synchronicity between the sacred number 432 showing up in the ratio, right, of the Jovian uh, orbit to the number of rotations in the Earth. So there seems to be that 432 link. Okay. I think if we do the Saturn, we're going to find out that the number is 10,800. There we go. There, there, there we go. Look at that. So now I'm going to take 10,800, and there's our number, 108, right? So for uh, people listening at home, it is 10 that we pulled it up, a screen share, and it is uh, as per coolcosmos dot com or edu it's 10755.7 earth days right so the correlation between earth days and the number of days in the saturnian orbit is 99.6 percent accurate huh so now you would have 10,000 if you tune the system just a little bit you know by uh let's see so minus one so and again, you, I'll emphasize that that could again be an inability to measure. Might be, yeah. You know, or, or maybe the system's tuning. We're trying to measure it all from. Earth. We're trying to measure it all from Earth, you know. Mm. Well, couldn't we be out in our measurements by that same percentage as they could be out in making it? No, I don't. I think we're more precise than that. Okay. It doesn't matter because we're point zero zero four percent being dead on where the ratio between uh the number of days in a saturnian orbit and the number of days uh and the number earth. of earth's orbit earth's orbit is so in other words so what would the equivalent of that be on an inch by 0. 0.004 you'd have an exact synchronicity yeah between 4,320, I mean, I'm sorry, 10,800 Earth days and the number of years. Sorry, what am I doing? Yeah, well, I get it, but so it's within the, it's within, so correct me if I'm wrong on this, that's 25 times more accurate than your eighth of an inch. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's a good way to put it. Thank you. So, so that's my point is what I'm trying to get to is when you, you begin to look at the architecture of the solar system, it displays in a very, very precise manner with a little bit of adjustment. You, you see that the, the template has determined the ratios. Now we're talking orbits here. We could also do distances. Uh, and there's in my advanced, I guess you could say, sacred geometry classes, we actually go through and draw out the whole geometric exercise that yields the positions and ratios of the planets in terms of spatial relationships. But interesting work going back, God, 10, 15 years ago, um, showing that the delivery of comets from the Kuiper disk to the inner solar system was totally dependent upon the, the masses and spacing of the outer planets. And if you were to change that at all, the delivery of comets from the zone outside of, of Neptune to becoming uh, Earth crossers wouldn't happen. Wow. I could pull that up if we take and a that, So that gets in again to this uh, me mechanism that allows for life to propagate potentially if 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 you're following span span, and that, that goes, span and that goes all the way down to the moon and the earth yeah and so when we get to the moon how we find that spacing well okay so do this if uh take the 221,000 Darren 221,000 okay. add to that go plus 252,000 and you don't have to be precise i think that's going to be close enough um, take the total, then divide that by two to get the average. 
I come up with about two hundred thirty-six thousand five hundred. The two, average six five hundred. That's the same number I got. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, two hundred thirty-six thousand five hundred being the average. Okay. Now uh, divide that by a hundred and eight. Divide that by a hundred and eight. We're going to be a little big, so it's going to be closer to uh, perigee. So let's go. You said at perigee, let's go 221,000. Okay. Go that times 108. Multiply 108. I'm sorry, 221,000. Uh, divide by 108. Divide by 108. Yeah. 200, 2046.29. Okay, so now we're on the low side. Okay, so here's what we can do. Go 2160, the diameter of the moon, and go that times 108. 2160 miles times 108. To get 233,280. 233,280, almost right in the middle of the uh, perigee and epigee. Yeah, almost right in the middle. So it's almost the average distance. So if you're just in conceptual terms, you could then say that the distance from the Earth to the moon, and of course, all of this is, is constantly changing, right? It's constantly because the moon doesn't stop, it keeps moving. So it's constantly adjusting. So you can say that there would be a point within its orbit around the Earth where it would be exactly right, right, eight times its own diameter from the Earth. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. I wonder when that time is. Has anybody ever like measured that exact time? Like, not that I know of. I may have attempted it once upon a time. Um, I don't like, know. it would be interesting to know if there's any any strange hap or not strange happening. Crazy you know, it was on a solstice, right? But see, the complication, the wrinkle there is, is that those aren't fixed points. Yeah, those right. points are constantly shifting. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 lunar perigee, you know, against the backdrop of the stars now, wouldn't necessarily be in the same position a month from now or a year from now. Um, well, what's that 18? What I mean, do we want to get into that 18.6 year cycle yeah, you're yeah. talking about the moon, or or do we have more to one more thing though? Yeah. One more thing. The diameter of the sun generally, and that's a you you can quibble about you know what's the sun's diameter. Um problem is the sun doesn't have a solid surface like the earth that you can measure. You've got you know, do you got the chromosphere? Do you include the chromosphere? Just like if you were going to measure the Earth, do you presumably you would measure the solid surface, but you could include the atmosphere, right? Yeah. If you're, but the 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 sun's uh, is much much more complicated than that. So, you know, if you include the chromosphere, it's closer to eight hundred sixty five thousand. But if you don't include it, then it's closer to 864,000 miles. And that's, I think, the traditional number that's been associated with the sun, 860, which is very close to the sun's actual diameter. Now, of course, what happens when you divide 864 by 2? You get 432,000. So that's interesting, isn't it, that the number of miles in the radius of the sun is 432,000. Let's see, you divided by, yeah, there you go. What'd you get there? Um, 8,000 when I divided uh, the diameter of the moon by 108. Sun. That, that's the diameter, the diameter of the sun. sun. Sorry. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, but now uh, multiply the diameter of the sun times 108. 864,000 times 108 yep. equals 9331200. There's your 93 million. Well, that's how far away it is, right? 93 million miles away. And that, so this is the one I talk about on the show all the time, is how the the moon has the weird thing where it's 27.3% the size of the Earth, and it's 27.3 days of rotation, mm -hmm. and the Earth is 300 and 65% the size of the moon, and it takes 365.25 days to do a rotation. 
and that's all by like NASA's own numbers. So it's either so to me, it's either it got made, it's intelligent design, or the numbers were like made up to fit some occult. Oh, something or other. Uh, and you could also point out that now this is gonna it it changes all the time, right? Because the moons, when you talk about the moons orbital velocity that's going to be taken relative to the earth that's going to be different at perigee than it is at apogee right but you can say and just like there's going to be a certain point within the moon's orbit where it is moving precisely uh in one hour in one of our hours a distance equal to its own diameter man that's interesting, isn't it? So it, it, it is when you get into it, you know, yeah, okay, so here, here, yeah, I mean, this is where I my mind starts to just sort of boggle into incoherence is that, well, you brought it up, Graham, I mean, or, or, or Darren, I mean, is this intelligent design or is it out of all possible world systems, this happens to be unique? And by whatever cosmic accident, it's just the right arrangement here in order for us to be sitting here having this uh, this uh, StreamYard meeting tonight. Well, I would offer you one more, and that could be, it could be like some weird law that just like, because if it, gravity doesn't work the way we think it does, and it's, you know, we've got other pretty smart people who thought it was magnetism and some other pretty, pretty smart people who think it's electric, but maybe it's just held in place by these ratios somehow. It's some some weird law that we don't understand. Is that a possibility? Well, if you start talking weird laws that we don't understand, <laughs> I, I suppose we could say, yeah, that's a possibility. Um, I don't know. I like I just, I don't know. I don't know. And... Uh, no, there's Malcolm calling me. I should have turned this off. He's got, I'm sure he's got some big news about the plasma yeah. technology developments. Want to bring him on the show? Then? Here's a question from the chats. I want to, I want to, this is a pretty good one from Mike. You, Mike, that's probably Wix. Um, the sun also rotates around its axis in the same time it takes the moon to go around the earth. Yeah, that's about right. I, I'm pretty sure that's about you could I, if you have it all pulled up there, Darren. I bet you can see the sun's rotational period. Interestingly, the sun's rotation, like it, it varies depending on latitude from the solar equator. But I think overall, you said his name is Mike. Uh yeah, I'm pretty sure Mike U U is our buddy Mike Wicks. He's been on a couple of trips. You would know him to see him for sure. I might have just uh, I probably just once in about 27 days. And of course, the rotational period of the moon around the Earth is twenty-seven point three or two-seven or something like that. So there again, we've got that little bit of discrepancy, but and twenty-seven is one fourth of one hundred and eight. So twenty-seven <laughs> times four is one hundred and eight, nice. and one hundred and eight times four is four hundred and thirty-two. So. Have you looked into the Tycho stuff at all? Like, is so? Let me just put it to you this way: Is it is it crazy to think that the Earth and the Moon could be at the middle of this thing still? Is it is that like definitely out of the question? Because well, I've seen some evidence that kind of has me leaning in the other direction, and I'm going to this conference this summer to look at this Tycho thing because they seem to explain some things and predict some things that that we have to come up with like retrogrades and stuff for, and maybe those make more sense to you than they do to me. But, you know, so I'll just, I'll present it to you that way. Is it out of the question that the earth is at the center of this thing? Uh, in other words, geocentric? Yes. No, well, geocentric? is that what you're saying? Geocentric in a binary system with the Mar with Mars in the sun though, Darren, I think is the key. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Right. There's more to it than that. Well, I haven't looked into it. I, you know, I haven't, at this point encountered anything that would make me question the heliocentric and I can explain retrograde motion um, relatively easy um, or at least I can demonstrate it. Um, it and yeah. I, I'll send you the book. And what, What's the name of the book? 
the Tycos model, I think. I've got it on PDF. I'll email it to you. Yeah, actually. I think we might have showed you on one of the trips because there's a few people that have been with us that have loved, like, the really yeah, into yeah, this, exactly. this whole model. And, yes, I and actually, I don't send me the book. I have it. Okay. And, and <laughs> from my scholarship days, I recall that Tycho was actually pronounced Tico. Yeah. Yeah. I can't get away from Tycho. It's hard, right? You want to say Tycho. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I was maybe five, six years, six years old, just learning to read. And we had classical music around my house, right? My mother was sort of into classical music. And so we had, we had records by, you know, orchestra of the great composers and stuff. And so I can remember, I, I hadn't quite learned how to read yet, but it was, um, the three oh. composers, the first three that I learned were, uh, Beethoven, Mozart, and Batch. Yeah. You remember Batch? Yeah. And then then only later did I learn Beethoven, Mozart, and Bach. Yeah. But no, actually it was years before I went from Bach to Bach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I finally, now in my seventh decade, got it down. <laughs> That's how you say it. Johannes Bach. Yeah. So, uh, so that's cool. Now, 108. So now we have uh, the other thing is that. So, let's talk about the plane of the ecliptic, which is why we have the plane of the ecliptic gets its turn name from eclipses. Which came first, the ecliptic or the eclipses? I think it would be the eclipses, right? I would have thought the other way, but I, I guess that would have been chicken and egg question. Which came first, eclipse or did the plane of the ecliptic? Okay, so I think eclipses would have been first. Is that what you're thinking, Darren? I was thinking the other way. The ecliptic was there and the eclipse is just a consequence of it. Well, it is. Um, but if you're, let's say you're a... Uh, Depends on where you're looking at it from, isn't it? You're not looking into the eclipses until you're not looking into the elliptical to discover it until the eclipse is what triggers that. So if you're a Paleolithic man, Darren, and you're standing out there and you're seeing an eclipse, well, obviously that would be something that someone without instrumentation, just using naked eye observations, you would see an eclipse probably before you figured out what the plane of the ecliptic was or or not i don't know no, you're right i agree with that hmm. well it's an interesting academic question but the point well, polymathing polymathing in the in the chat says the plane of the ecliptic is, is a human concept eclipses just happen well let's see do i agree with that the plane of the ecliptic just happens but it's a structure of the solar system i mean it's 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 the plane that is swept out if you were to take a giant rubber band attach it to the center of the sun and at the center of the earth and the earth revolving about the sun is going to sweep out that plane it's there it was not an invention of ours it was a discovery through observation right yep okay i like that i would look at it Unless I'm not sure that polymath meant that, but in any case, um, I don't think it matters which came first, the chicken or egg, the eclipse or the ecliptic. But that would be an interesting thing to research. Anyhow, so the let, let's define the plane of the ecliptic. Then I just defined it. it, it it's the plane that's swept out by the Earth and the Sun. It's if if you were to connect the center of the Sun to the center of the Earth that line would lie in the plane of the ecliptic. And then all the other bodies in the solar system are defined, their orbital elements are defined relative to that plane, the plane of Earth's orbit around the sun, right? So all of the other planets lie within the, the zone, but none of them lie exactly. They've all, their orbits are all tilted, and I, can, I don't know those off the top of my head. I do know that off my top of my head, that the moon's orbit is tilted 5.145 degrees 
off of the plane of the ecliptic, right? 1.5.145. So, so what that means is, is that for half of its orbit around the earth, it's above the plane of the ecliptic. And for half of its orbit, it's 5.145 degrees below the plane of the ecliptic. And there is that intersection point that's in its own way kind of analogous to the intersection of Earth's equator, the equatorial plane, and the plane of the ecliptic. And just as because of Earth's precessional motion like this, the intersection of the Earth's equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic is moving basically at the same rate, 50 seconds of arc per year of this. Okay, so I at this point, it would be a good idea to pull up the graphic and we can actually see. Um, is that you do? There we go. So here we see the moon is, is above. Here's this, the nodal point where the moon is crossing the plane of the ecliptic. And it's going down, coming back around and coming up here again. Now it's crossing from southern latitude into the northern celestial latitude and spends half of its time. And so an eclipse can only happen when the moon is at one of the nodes where the two planes are intersecting. Does that make sense? Can you see yeah. what Right. Yeah, that does. So basically yeah. on that red line, on those red lines, it's the only time it's on the same level as the sun. Otherwise, it'll be high or low. When, when, like when the moon is up here where this graphic is showing, you're not going to have an eclipse. Now, if it's close to the nodal line, you might have a partial eclipse. But in order to have a total eclipse, it needs to be right there um, at full moon. I mean, at new moon, uh, new moon has to coincide with the the lunar position right on this red line. Now, here's the thing. This red line isn't fixed in space. It's moving. It's rotating. And it takes 18.6 years to make one complete revolution. Oh, that's the cycle you're talking about. That's it right there. Yep. And the ancients knew about this cycle. Well, yeah, they did. They sure did. And that's, you know, yeah, they set up monuments sacred structures to memorialize that relationship. Um, I think what I will do is try to go to, let's see, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to try to pull up my other screen and show you an example of how they, let's see how they did that. Here we go. Maybe this is, uh, well, we, we did chimney rock together. Didn't we? We did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. That was our first sort of trip together. We did it in, uh, near the four corners in, in Durango there. Let's see. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That was in May of 2019 when we were in down in Durango okay. and chimney rock. Yeah, I remember seeing that we we looked at that spot where the where they saw the moon coming through. Yeah, that's what I'm going to pull up here. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm just rolling ahead here. Uh, you know, my moon presentation has, has swelled out to 329 slides. <laughs> Is it still headed in the same direction? Pretty much. Yeah. 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 Some, yeah, some interesting, you know, the more we learn about the moon, um, the mass cons are particularly interesting and what the hell are they? The one-to-one -one spin orbit coupling. That's interesting. Um, the overall low density is interesting. Uh, the slow decay of seismic vibrations, lunar transient phenomena. Um, What's a mask on? It sounds like a COVID thing. It sounds like what? A COVID thing. You know, mask on, you know, mask on. <laughs> uh, stands for mass concentration. Okay. 
and mass concentration is uh, are these extraordinarily dense zones under the the maria uh-huh. that are so uh, you know they're so strong that they actually deflect in the early days they were to when the lunar orbiters would fly over a mass con they would actually be deflected in their orbit because of this something really strong under the surface of the center of the mass con have they mapped those do they do they oh, have yeah. you seen the map of them do they look uh, yeah. does it look like does it look fake or organic no no no, no. it's it's no it i've mapped them i mean i haven't mapped them but i have the showing the maps of the mass cons i've got it in my 329 slideshow <laughs> right okay so uh are they all on the same side are they all on the same? Most of them are on the near side because most of the mass cons are on the near side, right? There's one mass con, I think, on the moon's far side. And I'm trying to remember if there's a mass con. Most of the Maria have these mass cons under them. And again, I wasn't really necessarily prepared to get into that. But if you wanted to, um, I could get it set up. We could take a little break or something and then we could come back to that. But this was, we were going to focus more on the eclipse. Uh, where am I here? Come on, damn it. I right, slide 29, 30. Okay, it just, it just, in fact, I just, do you want to, hey, well, since I've got it right here, you want to do share screen? Yep. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So here's, this is a lunar gravity map, uh, and the contour lines show the gravity strength above the mean value of moon in units of 100 milligals. I think you got to click on it still. We oh. don't see it yet. Yeah. Did you, can you see it now? No. I can't see it. You got to click present again. Oh, right. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, share screen. Share screen. Uh, should be the same window. But I got to select it again. Screen two. Yeah, there we go. You getting it now? Yep. Yep, we got it. <clears throat> okay, so these are these extremely dense regions underlying the lunar surface, mass concentrations. And uh, this is the near side Maria, which are the big, you know, the, the seas, the dark blotches. When we look at the moon and we see the man in the moon face, that's because of the Maria that we're seeing. Right. So the Maria, uh, all of the near face, near side Maria have these gigantic, well, we don't know how big they are, but whatever they are, they're extremely massive and extremely dense. And that's an anomaly. The reason it's an anomaly is because they are so much more dense than the surrounding material would be implied. Uh, that they should have eons ago sunk to the center of the moon. Just like if you put a little lead pellet uh, in, on, a, on a, say, on the top of a surface of a bowl of jello. You know, what's going to happen? It's not going to drop. It, it, of course, it depends on the viscosity. You put that lead pellet, and if it's water, it's going to go really fast to the bottom of the bowl. If it's yogurt, it's going to go, right? If it's, if it's jello, it may take, a couple of hours, but it's eventually it's going to sink through, you know, now if you took a green pea and put on there, it may not, it probably wouldn't sink. Right. But the lead pellet would sink. If you so know. is this a density density then, or how, what is, yeah, what is that brown dot right. then? It's, it's density. That's yeah. exactly what it is. And let's see here if I got something. On. So yeah. So here's another, uh, yeah. Vertical acceleration at the lunar surface for the LP one, six, five P gravity field. Acceleration of the radial component at the lunar surface sphere with radius 1738.0 kilometers. So 1738 kilometers times um, 1.62. Okay, so uh, the near side on the left includes coefficient to degrees in order 110. We don't need to explain all that, but this is again, showing these large density anomalies. Uh, Here we can look at this quote, the discovery by Muller and Sogren of mass cons in the moon 
is of great interest. My investigations allow a calculation to be made of the size and depth of the mass cons in terms of the size of the mare formed by low velocity impact of an iron meteorite. Now, the problem with that theory early on is that at whatever velocity you bring that collision to occur between meteorite and, and the lunar, the meteorite is going to basically vaporize. Um, so uh, I am currently completing an analysis of penetration and cratering of concrete and soils by steel projectiles. Uh, he goes on, let's see here. Uh, yeah, but even if it vaporizes, wouldn't it just maybe push or squash it all together to concentrate uh, the mass somewhere? Probably. So these results suggest that the lava-filled maria were formed when very large iron objects struck the surface of the moon at a velocity so low that there was no immediate fracture of the object. But that raises problems. The impact produced by a very large crater and the object penetrated to such a depth that deep material was melted by pressure release and flowed to the surface to fill the crater. The interior of the moon must have been solid when these events occurred because otherwise the dense iron meteorite would have sunk into the molten material, right? So was the, the moon molten or solid all the way through here? Uh, the suggestion by Muller and Sogren is very reasonable. However, the depth of the mass cons, which they take as 50 kilometers, seems to be considerably underestimated. The depth of an impact crater measured to the bottom of the shattered material in the crater is approximately one-fourth of the crater diameter, right? That's a good rule of thumb that you can use. Now, okay, so this means that if the maria are filled craters, the depth of imbrium should be about 300 kilometers. That's, that's uh, 60, that's 180 miles, but it sure ain't. In fact, it, it ain't, it's not any deeper than about or four miles and the depth of humorum was about 100 kilometers which would be about 62 miles if the mass cons are deeper as i suggest then they must also be more massive to produce the observed gravity anomalies so in other words the, the deeper they are the more massive they have to be to have that corresponding deflection of, of something flying over now if they had all sunk to the center right then then they're equal and it's you know you're not going to have it so it has to be close to the center the closer to the center the less the, the surface mass. closer to the surface thank you closer to the surface the less the mass um let's keep going here uh so here yeah muller and sogren this is another this is isostasis on the moon this is all research done back in the apollo days Muller and Sogren have performed the astonishing feat of providing a relatively detailed, though preliminary, gravi gravimetry, gravimetry of much of the front surface of the moon. The data from which they worked is in no sense marginal. The pertur perturbations of the orbiter satellites which they used are so large as to have been an operational nuisance before they were understood. The interpretation suggested to Muller and Sogren by the papers of H.C. Harold, that would be Harold C. Urey, and tentatively adopted by them, attributes the mass excesses in the Mari regions to mass concentrations, perhaps remnants of colliding asteroids, on the order of 100 kilometers in diameter buried under the lunar surface. Uh, on the other hand, both observation and experiment indicate that impact at normal meteor velocities leads to the scattering of the impacting mass as a result of shattering and vaporization. Even if it is supposed that the circular mare, maria were made by bodies already in orbit around the Earth, and hence having relative velocities of only a few kilometers per second, there remains a difficulty in supporting the mass. The pressure exerted by such a body on its base would be the order of eight kilobars, which is 110,000 pounds yes. per square inch. And <laughs> this exceeds the crushing strength of granite. It is reasonable that a mass of this kind would crush its way to the center of the effing moon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Muller and Sogren have concluded that there are very massive objects in certain locations at the surface of the moon. Now, that, you see, these are anomalies. These are things that 
raise some very interesting questions. Um, so yeah, if if the Mari Imbrium situation is taken as a prime example, because it exhibits a maximum effect, we come to the conclusion that the viscosity of the moon must be higher than that of the earth by a factor of 10 to the fourth. So that be, whoa. The difficulties we're running into here. And it is difficult to devise a lunar history, which provides the low temperature required to account for the lack of isostasy and the low electrical conductivity and at the same time for melting processes required to produce the basaltic material on the surface of the moon. So here you have these huge maria, you know, the 100 to 300 kilometers in diameter. They're extremely shallow relative to what theoretical calculations suggest their depth should be. And then right at the center of them, you have these enormous be dense masses of something. Um, so, so it almost, so it sounds like the, the, it was already dense mass and what, and it just, whatever impacted it couldn't go down any further because it was so dense. So it, well, it has to be density. shallow. So, but see the density is not a uniform thing over the surface. Then you have to assume that the density, if the density was already there, then all of the impacts that produced the Maria had to have impacted directly into that that anomalous dense area. In other words, go back to the to the lunar map we were looking at. So are all those are all the craters that have the same ratio of um, of depth to to length? No, no, but what they do have is they have a limit in depth. So they reach the depth. Their their typical cratering ratios up until you get about three miles deep, four miles deep. Okay. Then the craters keep getting wider. Right. Without any deeper interesting wow yeah so the the assumption would be if this if a meteor or an asteroid hit the moon where this density is did not vaporize and somehow for whatever reason did not sink to the center of the moon right so the question is if this was if if this if the mass con was already there then what was the mass con you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see. Uh, yeah. At one time, however, as the thinking. So the mascons must be why it's tidally locked with us too then. Well, that's, well, yes, because it's tidally locked to us because the crust apparently is so rigid that that yeah I'll, I'll i'll show that in just a second i think i can kind of explain that um at one time it was naively believed that mass cons are remnants of the dense projectiles responsible for the excavation of the basins right but it was soon realized that they would have been totally vaporized furthermore the largest mass cons only occur in those basins which were filled with mare basalt but if mass cons are simply layers of Mari basalt lying on top of low density crust, how is this excess mass brought to the surface in the first place? Well, if a planet is an isostatic equilibrium, the overburden pressure will be constant at any given distance from the center of the planet. Terrestrial continents are much thicker than the oceanic crust on Earth simply because Granitic type rocks have lower densities than oceanic basalts. The large mass cons of Imbrium and Serenitatis would certainly not have survived on a moon in isostatic equilibrium. They would have sunk without a trace. So perhaps the most remarkable aspect of mass cons is their very survival. The fact that they still exist today implies that the moon's crust must have been remarkably rigid for a very long time. So, yeah, you can see here, uh, this is just one of the anomalous things that are difficult to explain that we can add to the mystery of the moon. Let me see if I can, there was one, um, yeah, here we go. Uh, even though we have computed both masses and depths for the largest mass cons, nevertheless, our present quantitative data require further refinements. One may easily compute approximate masses from an assumed depth, 
say, such as 50 kilometers, which would be about 30 miles. The Mari Imbrium Mascon yields numbers on the order of 20 times 10 to the sixth minus sixth lunar masses. So that would be about one, uh, you know, one uh, over 20 with six zeros. A spherical nickel iron object about 100 kilometers or 60 miles in diameter would be a rough equivalent. So if this thing was 30 miles under the surface, it would be the equivalent to a object, an iron, nickel iron object. Which would be one of the heavier, would, would that be one of the heavier? The size of a city. Well, yeah, except you, you got to figure this thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, this thing, uh, yeah, but if you figure this is a solid object. It's, you know, if you had a spherical object, it would be 60 miles in diameter. And this thing is down, you know, just below the surface of the moon. And it ain't supposed to be there. Um, so does each of these mascons represent an asteroidal sized body which caused its associated mare by impact? If not simply the original impactor itself, by what processes were they formed in the lunar interior? Is the presence of these objects consistent with a molten lunar interior? Well, there's a question. I mean, if it's a molten interior, there's no question they're going to sink, aren't they? 100%. 100%. And the deeper they get to the center, the, the less effect they're going to have. And then, you know, once they've gotten to the center, they would have no effect at all. They would just, any, you know, they're going to operate, they're going to affect any lunar orbital module just as a point source that's, that's associated with the center of the moon's, uh, the center of the moon, the center of the moon's mass. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so a study of local accelerations on the spacecraft resulted in a gravipotential map of the lunar near side, which has revealed very large mass concentrations beneath the center of all five near side maria. Um, the largest rate of change in the accelerations over these mass cons reveals their relatively small physical extent, 50 to 200 kilometers. So, um, yeah, whatever they are, they're relatively small, not over. So this would be 50, this would be 30 miles to, um, 120 miles in diameter, if you want to talk about it in miles. So what the hell are they? What are these gigantic, or I say gigantic, I mean, relative to a person standing next to it, um, what are these gigantic, huge masses of something that would be the equivalent of a nickel iron sphere, you know, 60 there, miles in diameter? Is there a chance they're they're pulling the Maria in because could, could they be pulling the surface down because of their density? Uh, well, no, they're not. Because the this, in fact, the the uh, surface of the Maria are con convex upward. So they're domed upward. So like you could be, you know, the Mari are ringed by mountains. But if you're standing at the center of some of the larger Maria, you don't even see the mountains because they're below the horizon because of the, the convexity of the, of the crater floor. Is there any evidence of tunnels or catacombs leading down into the, those dense areas? Well, no, that's an interesting question to ask. Um, I mean, I mean, we all know what the elephant in the room is like underground moon bases, but you know, <laughs> where do you come I don't up? I want to be the one to have to say it, but I'm going to stop sharing for a second, if I can get out of. The, oh, let's there see. You go. You got to stop okay. sharing, don't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see. Now there should be, for whatever reason, I'm not being able to navigate from my presentation screen to my editing screen uh which is a little annoying yeah because i haven't quite got this uh the three the three this screens is the time, this is, by the way is the first time i've used Streamyard in a uh in a podcast like this okay so, well it's going pretty good so it's going pretty good yeah but i i like to have things right at my fingertips here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and show you uh something very interesting here with respect to your question uh here we go all right 
just about there. Okay, I think we're about there. Let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see. This should be it here. Okay. So uh, this goes back. Click share too again. Click share. Oh, I'll read this and then I'll oh, okay. it to a share screen. Yeah. Okay. So July 12, 2010. <clears throat> this was, uh, let's see, this occurred. This was, I believe, on the NASA, NASA's website. Uh, yeah. Okay. So a whole new world came to life for Alice when she followed the white rabbit down the hole. There was a grinning cat, a hookah smoking caterpillar, and maybe later, Graham, you could explain what that means to Darren, a mad hatter and much more. It makes you wonder what's waiting down the rabbit hole on the moon. And then this quoting from NASA's website, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, is beaming back images of caverns hundreds of feet deep, beckoning scientists to follow. They say hundreds, but they don't actually know how deep they are. And then Mark Robinson of the Arizona State University, who is the principal investigator for the LRO camera, said this, they could be entrances to a geologic wonderland. We believe the giant holes are skylights that formed when the ceilings of underground lava tubes collapsed. Japan's Kagu Kaguya spacecraft first photographed the enormous caverns last year. Now the powerful Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, the same camera that photographed Apollo landers and astronauts tracks, and the moon dust is giving us enticing high resolution images of the caverns entrances and their surroundings. So I am going to do a screen share now. Uh, share screen, select window or screen, screen two, there we go. This pit in the moon's Marius Hills is big enough to fill, fit the White House completely inside. And here's another one. It's almost twice uh, the size of this one. That seems a weird thing to use for scale. Who knows how big the White House actually is? <laughs> well, okay. I don't know. We got a fact checker. Okay. <laughs> How big is so this one? Uh, twice the size of one of the Marius Hills. Yeah, uh, this one could uh, big enough to fit the White House completely inside. But how 50, deep? Uh, Fifty-five thousand square feet. Okay. Well. Okay. So. Okay. Can you do that in kilometers? Can you make that in kilometers? Well, I'll do fifty. What did you say? Fifty-five thousand square feet. So yeah. the square root of that is two hundred and thirty-four. So if it, if the area of the White House was a square, that square would be about 235 feet on a side. Okay. Okay. So if the entire White House can fit in here, uh, what I'm guessing, though, however, is that the White House isn't a square. It's a rectangle. Probably. So I'm it guessing. Rectangular. It looks like about a three to one. Three to one? Yeah, so conservatively. Thousand square feet. So say seven hundred feet or something on the one. Yeah, around seven hundred feet. So then, I'm I'm assuming that's how I would interpret this. So let's say this one has got to be to fit it in. It has to be a little bit bigger. So somewhere between seven hundred and a thousand feet in diameter. This one then is it's a somewhat look from this photograph looks to be not perfectly circular. It looks like it's elliptical. Uh, but if it's twice the size, then it's going to be, what, 1,500 feet, 1,800 feet, something like that in diameter? Yeah. Large enough that I would imagine that, you know, a good uh, pilot. Good size, yeah, a good size ship could come out of there. Yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm, yep, a good size <laughs> ship could come out of there, couldn't it? <laughs> the Which, Empire State Building could almost come out of that thing. Yeah. Which leads you to wonder, where where does that lead? 
What's that little inside the uh, inside the radius there, underneath the lip? Is that just like a part of the inner structure there? You can see on the left. On the left, there's a, yeah, right down a little bit. There seems to be like this. It's not a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but I'm like to get more images, higher resolution images, which you know, with the Artemis, I wonder if that's going to be something that comes out of the Artemis missions or some of the other missions that are. Japan is flying back to the moon. China's going to be going to the moon. You know, we're kind of sitting on our asses. They've already, you know what, and I got to throw this in, they're already scaling back the Artemis missions that were planned three stage to, you know, we did the first stage. Um, second stage was to actually send, the first stage was just send the orbiter around on it without astronauts. The second stage would be send the orbiter around the moon with astronauts. And the third stage would be send the, the orbiter and then it would be a lander that goes down and, and, and ferries astronauts to the surface, which they would, the timetable was roughly one a year. So basically probably by the end of next year or 2026 at the earliest, we would, the U.S. would now have a, a return to the moon, a man landing on the moon. However, uh, NASA's budget's being cut way back in order to be able to send sixty billion over to Ukraine. Literally, yes, that's sir. that's where what's happening. There's money is being taken from all these other places. You know, we can't afford to, you know, complete that program now because we have to send another sixty billion down the rat hole of the Ukraine war and the rest of it. That it's probably going also to to continue climate with change and. Military all, all of the bullshit. Yeah, all of the bullshit that there's completely wasting. Well, yeah, I mean, look at the, uh, the 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 Inflation Reduction Act has billions and billions of dollars to address a non-existent climate crisis. Told, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, the best case scenario is in the aftermath of that orgy of pointless spending. We we are able to, uh, ex, you know, uh, salvage some some use or value out of it, but for the most part, it's just money down a gigantic toilet is what it is. But as long as they have the power to, you know, print money willy nilly and tax all of us people that are making an honest, you know, working honestly to make a living, they're going to be able to continue to throw money down into the cesspool. And not to go to the moon. Not to go to the moon. But so this is very interesting stuff. So let me then, uh, we'll stop share again, and I'm going to go back so we can get to, uh, go back to the question of eclipses. We kind of got, dig we digressed there, but I hope it was an interesting digression. Oh, yeah. It was. Okay, good. Yeah, so I'm flying back to my, ancient observatories here. I got to tell you, man, I got some interesting stuff in this program here that uh, I've decided that we've got to have more. People have been bugging me for years, and I've been a little bit wary about releasing this uh, prematurely. And then when I found out we were going to be doing the Artemis program, I thought, well, okay, so... I'll do a three-stage disclosure coordinated with the Artemis missions. And then now with the, with the question as to whether the Artemis missions will proceed as planned, you know, I don't know. I'll tell you what, though, we got to get that Biden administration out of there down here, and you guys need to get Trudeau out from up there. That's right. It seems to be trending in that direction. I hope so. I hope so. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to sh screen share, uh, share screen, screen to allow. All right. So for anybody who wants to do this kind of research, this is one of the best, the work of Alexander Tom. And this is his work. He spent, God, decades. He was a surveyor and he spent decades. He was a, a he was also an engineer who was also an expert in surveying. And so he spent decades um, surveying 
what he calls the megalithic lunar observatories, which shows, I mean, his work along with the work of many others at this point now, this is from 1971, as you can see. So this is what, over 50 years old now, but his surveys are still accurate, that the implications of them have, you know, are still, uh, still valid. But what he did show was that there were many people in the ancient world that were obsessively watching the moon and observing the motion of the moon. And then he uses, uh, like here's Stonehenge. Now this is from, uh, not from uh, Tom's work, but Tom's is the essential work that anyone wanting to dive into this should probably start with. But so this is the, the lineup showing the uh, alignments of Stonehenge. And you can see here, uh, you've got most southerly, uh, most southerly uh, moonrise. You've got uh, you've got the sunrise in there over here is most northerly moonset and most southerly moonrise there. And you've got it's primarily solar, but they've also got the the lunar alignments in it. Um, let's see here if we go to the next one let's see here we go yeah here this is the one i was looking for so here the red line is the midsummer sunrise and then through these two apertures again if you're at the position of the of the uh, altar stone here and you're looking out the midsummer sunrise is lined up with the heel stone but then through these two apertures you have the major and minor lunar rising positions now one of the things you got to picture is, uh, you know, you the moon swings on the horizon, just like you know how during the course of the year, the the positions of let's take sunrise on equinoxes, sunrise is rising due east. Now, as you go from spring equinox to into towards summer solstice, what's happening is each day the sun is going to rise a little further north on the horizon right and then it's going to reach its most northerly limit on the horizon which is going to be yeah which you would you would tweak it for your latitude of observation and then it'll on solstice it'll pause for a few days at summer solstice it'll swing backwards and then on fall equinox it'll be rising due east and then each successive morning from there it'll be rising further to the south on the horizon and it swings back and forth like that right now that angle of swing between the most northerly and most southerly uh, is gonna be pretty well fixed with respect to the sunrise, but with respect to the moon, because of the fact of that 5.145 degree tilt, it actually affects the limits of the moon's rising and setting. So there's a minor rising. So in other words, imagine if the sun one year would, would come to the north and pause shift back to the south, but the next year would move a little further on the horizon. So now that would be the major rising point and the minor, right? Well, so this is what happens with the moon. There's a minor and there's a major. But in order to complete that whole cycle, that's where the 18.6 years comes in. So from Stonehenge, uh, you can see that, oh, here we go, look at over here. Here's your major midsummer moonrise and here's your minor midsummer moonrise. Here's your midwinter, and here's your midwinter moon set, major and minor. So built into Stonehenge, it's not only a solar calendar, it's also a lunar calendar. And then here's Newark. And you know what, something that we should consider is putting together a monumental earthworks of the Ohio and Mississippi Valley tour and have a you know a four or five or six day immersion into learning all of these the, the the principles and and so on that are built into these ancient earthwork monuments now of course a lot of them are you know what we have today in america is no more than probably 10 percent of what was here a thousand years ago right but there's enough that one can still do a tour and come away with a pretty pretty comprehensive understanding of of the system now here this is newark and here you can see the long axis of the structure you've got this perfect circle surrounded by a larger circle and then it goes into this flattened octagon and the whole thing is laid out on an axis and you'll notice in the flattened octagon 
that there are apertures in the perimeter, right? And then you can also see that there's a causeway. There are causeways going down here leading to other geometric earthworks. And notice the causeways. You've got these long causeways here. This was a magnificent monumental structure in its heyday. But this is where it's interesting. Now this is, okay, so here's this circle. Here's the, the uh, aperture, the, 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 the uh, I guess you'd call it even this short, it's probably still be a causeway uh, that leads from the circle to the octagon. So here you have it. And here's the long axis pointing to the maximum northern moonrise. And that's in this artist depiction, that's what's being shown right here. Here's the maximum northern moonrise. So if you're facing oh, north, yeah, yeah. So you're facing north here. So uh, this is maximum. So then uh, on other uh, rising points, it's going to be here. So if you were using a 13th month, 28 day calendar, then you would always be able to know where exactly you were in that, right? Ah, good question. Well, maybe I would have to. I would have to think that through. Um, like in the in the in those days, they they might have used like you know not the Gregorian twelve month calendar, but twenty eight times thirteen is a is a year, right? So, yeah. Let's see. So twenty eight. I think what's that? Three sixty four. Twenty eight times thirteen. I mean, some people say they were using that cal calendar as or late as like the late 1800s, early 1900s. People showed evidence of a 13-month calendar. Well, but... Yeah, there's definitely lunar calendars that have been in use. Yeah. Um, but check out the, the the alignment. They got every alignment every, of relevance incorporated into the design of this earthwork structure. And it all depends, again, where you, if you know where to position yourself for the observations, you got it all. You can see the minimum, you'll know when the minimum northern moon set, the maximum southern moon rise. Wow. The maximum northern moon set, the minimum southern moon rise. Uh, minimum northern moon rise, check out this angle here, is determined by the side of this flattened octagon. And then maximum northern moon rise. So, What's going to happen is if you're watching the moon rise throughout the course of a month and then the course of a year and then through the full cycle, that's when you're going to see this these positions on the horizon are changing. That's fascinating. How come they're, uh, how come they're so curious about that? About the moon? Would be, yeah, would this have been for a calendar? Would this be for calendar purposes or... Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say that that was its ultimate purpose, but it certainly served as a lunar calendar. If you just knew where to go and, and the proper position, vantage point, yeah, you could track with a high degree of accuracy the motion of the moon through the full cycle. And plus, over 18.6 years though, right? So that's points. over the 18.6 year cycle. Yes. And then here's, if you look at the Pueblo Benito, the alignment of the wall here is midpoint of the lunar cycle. Fascinating. Huh. Did we go there? Did we go to that Pueblo Benito? I think so, eh? On one of our tours? Yeah. Well, it's in, it's in New Mexico. Oh, maybe not. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I thought that might have been near Chaco, Canada, the one that we went uh, to the, uh, Chimney the Rock. one that you're about to show next, actually. Yeah, Chaco, I mean, Chimney Rock. Chimney yeah, Rock, this yeah. Is, now, this is in Chaco Canyon. Right, we didn't go there, no. Yeah, we went no. to Mesa Verde. Mesa, we did go to Mesa Verde, yes, from which is in Colorado. Or, do we yeah, cross that's right. It? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. we were Colorado. Yeah. All right. So here's Chimney Rock. Here is the Kiva. And you can't see it now because it's not there, but there was an observatory tower that they had built right here. And when you were in that observatory tower, we determined that this is looking east, right? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing here is the sun setting in the west, casting the shadow here to the east. Now, interestingly, 
you know, as the sun migrates along the western horizon throughout the course of the year, the shadow will be migrating back and forth. Now, let's go and look at it from the vantage point of the ridge here. And here you can see the major standstill of the moon's path, the summer solstice sun, and the minor standstill of the moon path. So what's happening in 2024 is the major standstill of the moon's path. So right from the vantage the point right through, yeah. So basically you're here at full moon, you will see the full moon rising between the two pillars. Wow, this year. Yeah. When? when? I can get the dates. I was oh, it, 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 yeah, it's okay. Just it just once, right? At the the one one time. It it, it you know it, for a full year, it's it's in this it's rising in this region. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, yeah. So you're going to have multiple. You're going to have probably six months where, just by positioning yourself a little different from your vantage point, you're going to see the moon rising pretty much right there between the two pillars. That's right, because it's like 9.3 years down to that minor, right? That would be about right, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so so that is Chimney Rock. So getting back to our diagram, um, the point is, is that I think we probably should pull that up again so i'll stop sharing and i wish i had better navigation here i'll figure out if we do this again i'll have it figured out how to uh navigate a slideshow in Streamyard. Uh, but i can get us there in a second okay that is slide number 57 okay not bad okay so let's just go uh there we go all right, so again, share. This. Oh, yeah, share. Yep, 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 yep. All right. There we go. So this is rotating. So what's going to be happening in, what? what's the date of it, Darren? The eclipse? The eclipse is April 8th, 2024. April 8th. Okay, so on April 8th, what's happening is the moon is going to be right on this spot right here, right at the intersection, because it, it's a total solar eclipse. So it's got to be right almost dead on this position at the time of full moon. I'm sorry, back up. I said it again, at the time of new moon. New so moon. in other words, this this node has lined up with the sun. So if you were to draw a line, a straight line would intersect the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun on April 4th. Is that what you said, April 4th? April 8th. April 8th, yeah. So on April 8th, you can draw, If you, imagine this red line extends, shift the Moon around, put the Moon right here, and then continue the line on out, and that line would then intersect the Sun. So basically, you've got the lineup of the uh the earth the moon and the sun and it's right on the node and then next month uh the full moon will not be aligned with the node so it'll have to go make its trip around and then align with the node on this side but again it also has to be full moon you know the moon the moon every month crosses the node but you don't have the alignment with the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like every 300 and some 375 years, the eclipses repeat or close to. Oh gosh. Oh, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but that sounds about right. The ancients, it seems like most of the ancient cultures thought the eclipse was some kind of omen or some kind of uh portent of, of change, you know? Um, yeah. Is there, is there, do you think there's any, anything to that at all? Or was that, was that just a superstitious thing for them when they see the, you know, I think there could be something to that. I sure could. Um, because look to me, when you start studying from the, this vantage point of, you know, the, the sacred cosmology 
it seems like everything, it's all part of a fine-tuned machine and everything is intrinsic to the operation of that machine. Now, as far as what happens during eclipses, one thing that comes to my mind is this. You're putting like under a total solar eclipse, you're putting large regions of the Earth's surface under shadow. All of a sudden, the uh, the so incident solar radiation has been interrupted, right? Now, if that is over a major, like what is the uh, the area of the cone of the shadow when it hits the Earth? When 180 hits, kilometers, I think. How many? 180 kilometers, I think. That would, could be about right. So, so I, yeah. I did clarify it's... Uh, the total solar eclipses repeat every 360 to 410 years. Okay. Okay. And then the cycle would begin over. And then we're talking about this nodal point relative to the fixed stars is, is basically what's happening is every 360 to 400 and whatever years, this is lining up with the same stars again. The 100 to 123 miles is the width of the solar eclipse. Yeah. The, where the, oh, so now you've got... Well, the, at some point, it'll be 108. Well, yeah, probably so. Well, okay, so you've got this shadow that's interfering with the normal absorption of solar, of thermal energy by huge, huge masses of rock. Now, if there is, say, a fault line that is, you know, somewhere close to failure, could that rapid cooling and rapid warming again affect seismic activity, volcanic activity, tectonic activity? And I think the answer is that's very plausible. It could. So that might be one way um, that one might translate into actual like there in terms of geophysics now could it have other roles to play like in biological life you know i i haven't i know there's studies that are out there that i haven't even accessed yet that probably are going in that direction and that would be a very interesting thing to a uh, research area to undertake um but yeah I, I can't say i don't know for sure uh but damn now i want to just Go look that up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so many because so many of them. I mean, almost all the ancient country, uh, cultures thought it was an omen or a portent of disaster, and they would do ceremonies or rituals to cleanse negative uh, energies or sacrifices, even to appease to appease whatever gods. Yeah. I wonder if those. This is purely speculative. I wonder if those alignments, like between Earth, Moon, and Sun could somehow affect the orbits of near earth asteroids or, you know, I don't know that I'm getting into some very rarefied speculative territory there, but you never know. I, again, there's so much interesting science and research and discovery going on. It's hard to keep up with it. all. Yeah. yeah. Although it's often, it's very fun and interesting to do that. Well, we're supposed to maybe get a sneak peek at a comet or something this time. They were saying there's like a chance. I don't know how big the chance is, but that there could be a comet that becomes visible at the time of totality. Really? Oh. Let me fact check myself. Yeah, that's a probably a good good idea. Uh yeah, somebody mentioned in the chat there. That's kind of what I was thinking. There's a chance yeah. that Comet Ponds Brook, which is prone to volcanic outbursts, could be seen during the total eclipse. Washington Post. Wait, which comet? Uh, comet Ponds, Brook. Ponds Brooks. Ponds Brooks, okay. Huh. Yeah, Catastrophic New England in the chat says, what will all those high-energy particles do to biological life when the magnetic field goes down for a bit? Mm -hmm. turbocharged evolution you know that kind of stuff i mean that's the other thing you're, well, you're kind of who was who made that comment that's an I, interesting point i mean yeah well what effects is it having on the geomagnetic field yeah i mean it could i mean i would think it has to have effects and and those effects have to be connected i would think with why 
so many presumably independent peoples, even in the Paleolithic times, were obsessively watching. I mean, why would you do it? Why would, you know, if you're a hunter-gatherer society, um, foraging or hunting or whatever, or even agricultural, why would you need to erect gigantic structures and monuments in order to track lunar motion with that degree of precision? I mean, there would be no apparent practical reason for undertaking such a thing. And if one culture did it, um, you know, you could say, well, whatever, these guys were, this was idiosyncratic, the, whatever these, this was a tribe of weirdos, so they did all this. But then you've got this happening all over the world. That's a great point. I mean, that might be the way to tr why Darren, Darren asked that question before, whether it was solely calendar or not, but that might be the other thing. And so they track, you know, the rituals and the ceremonies that they do when, when the moon's in certain phases. Well, for one thing, with the position of the moon, you know, uh, for example, full uh, new moon, right? Even even there's there's no eclipse during the the day of new moon. You can't see the moon, right? Because you have to go out there and you look directly into the sun. And then you know whatever three four five days later you see that thin crescent, right? It's it's showing up in the sky, but there's a difference, an angular difference between the position of the moon and the position of the sun. Now, if you're trying to calculate the exact position of the sun, but how do you do that, right? You can't look directly at the sun. You can't track its position in the sky relative to the, to the constellations, could you? Because you can't, I mean, you couldn't look at this. I mean, now we can using instrumentation, but if you're using the naked eye, however, if you know that angular separation, between the sun and the moon, you can extrapolate from that, may mark your position of the new moon rising and extrapolate from that. And now you're going to be able to get the position of the sun with a oh, wow. high degree of accuracy. So it might be involved ultimately with solar observations and being able to calculate with precision where is the sun relative. But I, I don't know. Then you've got, you know, I mean, you could do I mean, it's amazing what you could do with simply a stick in the ground, right? You put a stick in the ground, a vertical stick, and uh, I'll stop share for a minute. You put this vertical stick in the ground and you draw a circle around it. Well, you can, from there, you can then generate your four cardinal directions in one day, one reasonably sunny day, right? And then, of course, you could refine it with a higher degree of accuracy by making multiple observations over the course of say a year, then you could get a really, really precise. But yeah, you could you could get a north, south, east, west quadrant laid out on the ground with a high degree of accuracy just by putting a pole in the ground and drawing a circle around it and tracking the motion of the shadows of the rising and setting sun on the pole. And and one of the things that I've done, and I never did record it, but I want to do this again and record it, is show how ancient peoples could have used a gnomon pole, set it up vertically, drawn the circle around it, and then determined your north, south, east, west axes. Well, once you've got that, I mean, what else do you need? I mean, if you if you want to know when to plant crops, why would you need the rising position of the sun, you know, to fractions of a degree? Well, I, mean, I think you might want you to also don't need to be tracking like twenty year cycles. You what? You also don't need to be tracking nearly twenty year cycles. No. And you, you certainly wouldn't need to be tracking this precision lunar motions. What practical reason would there be for that just from the standpoint of a farmer? I mean, I grew up in Minnesota and all our neighbors were farmers, and as far as I know, none of them had monumental earthworks or you know, megalithic temples on their farms that they use to know when to plant their alfalfa. Lycanthropy, maybe? And what? Lycanthropy, maybe? Lycanthropy? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, perhaps in Darren's case, yeah. <laughs> hey, look, I went through a phase in my youth where I wanted to be a werewolf, so... <laughs> <laughs> It was just a phase, though. Hey, the kids are doing it these days, too. So, you know, it, like anthropy is back, but they don't call it that. They have these other names for it. Really? Transgenderism. Well, 
you got to get rid of lichen because that goes back to the Greek myth, right? Yeah. Greek light, like lichen gave us lycanthropy. Um, yeah, I loved monsters as a kid, and and the the werewolf was my favorite monster. I, I just could thought, picture you as a werewolf. Um, well, you know my name, Randall, comes from Rand Wolf. Yeah, Rand Wolf Tours. Rand Wolf Tours. Randall and Randolph, which came from Rand Wolf. Do you have any Rand Wolf tours coming up? I mean, that's probably a good segue into that. Uh, let's see. Well, um, you got one with us May 13th to 18th. Yeah, that's a what do we call that one? Yeah, that, that's the Scablands. Yeah, I know that I know where we're going. I mean, well, that's what we call it too the Randall Carlson Scablands tour. Oh, okay. Which you don't like call it the Grimerica Scablands? Well, the ca- contact at the cabin. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the, yeah. 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 So maybe we should bill it as, you know, contact at the cabin and Randwolf Tours or something like that. Yeah, we should. And then uh, we've got the Gorge in September with you as well. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, that's going to be. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Oh, and, you, well, and you're going to Cosmic Summit as well. Right. Well, the Cosmic Summit's in June. Yeah, I'm look. Yeah, I was on a conference call with George Howard today, and some of the the gang that's going to be showing up there. What an interesting, eclectic group of really smart people that have incredible information to share. Oh well, okay. There's a reason for that. Okay, let's not mm-hmm. let's not go there. I generally we have we have a room. You go down in my basement. Um, Every full moon, and we've got a, a cell down there with thick steel bars. Every full moon, my wife locks, locks me in. So <laughs> I keep a cot in there. You should stream it one time. You should stream it one time. Just let, let her let you out one for one like episode. Just do do an episode for us. Uh, just try try let being let out. Oh, real? <laughs> okay. Do you guys ever see... Uh, I can remember actually my first introduction to horror movies was they had released in 1958. They released all the old classic universal monster movies to television. And, you know, that was the the famous Boris Karloff, uh, Frankenstein and Bela Lugosi, Dracula. Godzilla, maybe two in there. No, 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 no. Your, your, your timeline is way off there, Graham. (laughs) Godzilla is the fifties. Okay. Okay. We we have see there's a major conceptual shift that occurred between the 30s and the 50s. 30s we call that gothic horror, you know, like Bram Stoker, um, you know, Mary Shelley, you know. Interestingly, you know Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in 1816, The Year Without a Summer. Did you know that? I knew it was no. in the early 1800s. I didn't know it was The Year Without a Summer. It's a year without a summer. There was a succession of huge volcanic eruptions that preceded that year. And so that year was shrouded in darkness. And you know what they say in alchemy about being in darkness, right? That's when things grow. Well, hmm, interesting. Okay. I don't know if that's what Mary Shelley had in mind, but, you know, they were they were her and uh, Percy By- By- Bythe Shelley. And who was the other one? They were, they were sojourning in uh, the Alps, I believe it was. And because of the severe cold, agriculture f- collapsed that year. For example, in New England, they were having July 4th celebrations and it was snowing. They must have not been paying their carbon taxes back then, Ron. I mean, what was going on? That was obviously it. So anyways, people were dying. And, you know, she was seeing the carts with the dead, you know, bring out your dead. And it's been referred to as the last great subsistence crisis of Western civilization, 1816. So she wrote that, wrote that book and it was inspired by being holed up in this castle, you know, seeing all of this stuff going on 1816. So anyways, because of that, all those, that early stuff, you know, was referred to from, from that time, say up until the late Victorian times, all of that is kind of considered gothic horror. So that would include H.G. Wells, The Invisible Man. It would include Bram Stoker, Dracula, and all of that. Now, if you look at those early 
horror movies. They were all those, those, those gothic movies. And then that sort of declined into forties. And then after world war two, starting in 1950, 51, the movie shifted. And now instead of, you know, vampires being raised from the dead, you know, going back, you know, lycanthropy, the ancient story, because werewolves go back to ancient Greece and, and way earlier than that. Right. Um, instead of going back, they were now like when you brought up Godzilla, remember Godzilla was an atomic mutant monster. Right. 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 right? And in the fifties now is when you start seeing aliens and flying saucers and sci-fi going to other planets and all of the, there was too many to count atomic mutant type monsters. Right. So what, what these movies were doing was they were an expression of the, 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 the collective consciousness of the time, see? And so, um, I do remember this sitting down they, and, and weirdly, I don't know why they did this. You guys are old enough to remember Saturday morning cartoons. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. When did that end? Nineties, 2000. I mean, for my generation, it was a big deal. You got up Saturday morning, like at seven o'clock and you watched cartoons until noon. Mine too. Right. And like the, in, in the eighties and early nineties, it was still a thing. Yeah. It was still, and a I thing. would think it probably was right up until on demand took over. I think you're right. Yeah. Now, why what, what might have changed is when I was watching cartoons, you still that was before the days of political incorrectness. So a lot of those cartoons I was watching were pretty wild. If you don't believe me, pull up and watch an old Heckle and Jekyll cartoon. <laughs> OK, um, so anyways, I weirdly, one of the local stations in Minnesota started airing those universal classic monster flicks at noon right after the right after the cartoons <laughs> so i'd watch the cartoons and then the next thing all of a sudden you know it's uh frankenstein coming up or uh bella lugosi dracula and from the from the first moment i was addicted to horror movies six years wow. old seven years old but but the first one I ever saw, the first horror movie I ever saw was The Werewolf of London. Nice. You ever heard of that or seen that? Before? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah they remade it, I think, right? Well, they made American maybe Werewolf now. Yeah. The and that was inspired by Werewolf of London. But the tale was very interesting. It was he was the, the protagonist was a botanist and he'd heard about this, the rare moonflower. So he went to Tibet to get the Marafaza or Marafaza plant, I think it was called, which was, it only bloomed under the full moon. But it turns out, you find out later in the film that it was also the only antidote for lycanthropy. But he's going there to this, on this expedition and they're going up the trails, up the mountains. And the closer they get to this place where the legend has it, the Marafaza, Marafaza plant grows, the more soup, superstitious the porters get until finally they freak out and they won't go any further they run away and he's there with his assistant and they're climbing up and then they start getting uh, all these weird magnetic field effects on them where they they can't walk and then his assistant gets afflicted by this and he can't walk anymore so the 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 hero of the story pushes on it was the actor henry hull he pushes on and he finally gets up to this place and there's this big boulder and down in front of the boulder is the mirror. He sees the Marafaza plant. And then as he's going up to it, he's going to get a, he's going to get a specimen of that to take back to his laboratory in London. And as he goes up there, he's kneeling down. The full moon is rising over this rock and the plant begins to, you know, open up. And then as he's sitting there kneeling down, you see the big rock and then over the head of the, over the top of the rock, you see the werewolf's head come up <laughs> and that was the moment that moment was a, that was a pivotal moment in my life <laughs> i like it what a great story because as soon as that i i, I was like addicted and so that was it that was it that was my first did, did, did the werewolf kill him did he did he uh well okay so the the werewolf jumps down and they have a big fight and i think if i remember right the hero pulls out 
a knife and stabs the, the, the werewolf and it runs off, except he's been bitten. Right. right. That, that's right. how lycanthropy is, you know, is passed on from one to another. You got to get bitten by it. Yeah. yeah. So right. he gets bitten by it and uh, then goes back to London and doesn't know that he's a werewolf. However, it turns out that the werewolf that attacked him, the man, followed him back to London. Right. Because he was apparently in there looking for the same thing. <laughs> right. He was looking for the same plant, except now the full moon rose and he turned into the werewolf. <laughs> right. So this guy follows this, this cycle. Yeah. So he goes back to London and he's trying to cultivate the plant in his laboratory. And then it turns out that there's this, you know, he this doctor or whoever it is, the other the other scientist comes to him and explains to him, well, you're a werewolf now and you're going to be you're going to on the full moon, you're going to turn into a monster and of course he doesn't believe him and then the full moon does come and so he turns into a werewolf and uh it, it's a fun movie and and you you know the way they handle the special effect i think it was 1930 i think it was 34 35 it came out the movie werewolf of london and i i think you can i think it's free to download on online um it's probably on youtube it's probably on youtube yeah yeah, but th that was the the first ever, to my knowledge, that was the first ever werewolf movie, and then then they 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 did a new version of it in the in the updated maybe the early forties with Lon Chaney as the Wolf Man. Yeah, there's some classics in the thirties: Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, and The Black Cat. Yeah, yeah, and The Invisible Man. Yeah, cool. yeah, I saw all of so every Saturday they would show those horror movies and i was right there made sure i was plunked in front of the tv i wasn't going to miss any of them me too but, you know, well randall i think i think we've created another uh another entertaining and epic grimerica and randall carlson podcast is there anything you think we didn't get to oh yeah there was more that we didn't <laughs> talk about than we did talk about so but that's the never-ending dilemma I guess we'll have to keep doing these shows then. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we ended really interestingly with, with lycanthropy. So, um, absolutely. So Where can yeah, people find interesting tales connecting, you know, with the cycles of the moon? Yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. sure there's some, some hidden gems of, of research waiting to be discovered in that. All, All right. right. Shut up now. Where can uh, where's the best people for people to find your stuff? We know it's Cosmography on on YouTube. Is everything just at RandallCarlson.com now? That's probably going to be the best. But you know we're doing I'm you know because of the difficulty of the four of us, myself, Brad Young, and the snakes, the Snake Brothers, getting together every week. Where we realized you know we when we first started Cosmography like four years ago, we were all our schedule were such it was pretty easy for the four of us to get together every week and churn out regular content. But then it's gotten more and more difficult. So to fill in the gap, I'm launching Squaring the Circle podcast. And I'm going to cover a whole lot of stuff in there, and it's going to come out more frequent. I'm going to try to get out like a couple of episodes every week because there's so much going on and so much to report on and so much to talk about. So Squaring the Circle, uh, I'm in fact, when we're done here tonight, I'm working up We've got about five episodes in the can right now, but I don't have a good introductory episode yet where I'm kind of laying out the game plan and here's here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what we're going to be focusing on, what we're going to be talking about, investigating and stuff. So I'm working on that. Um, in fact, when we finish our podcast, that's probably what I'm going to shift gears on and, and finish polishing up the, the, the script, if you will, where I'm talking about, you know, I've got, it's all bulleted now, but I want to get it into a more like a narrative. Um, so yeah, we'll be doing square yeah. in the circle and, and then, uh, let's see, I'm going to do earth origins with, uh, Robert Dakota in April. Uh, and that's going to be in Sedona and there's going to be kind of an interesting lineup there. And then I, that's the next thing I have scheduled. And then after that, it's the Cosmic Summit in June. And that's, I think that's, wow, that's exciting news about the podcast. A lot of people must be, are going to be excited about that. When do you expect that to drop them? Probably pretty quick if you already got some episodes yeah, in the can. Before the month is over. 
And then uh, it's going to be hosted on Rumble. It'll be pushed out to all the social media. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of exciting. And, and that's why, you know, we've gone through this evolution of the studio here. Because, um, you know, a year or two ago, I just had one webcam, one monitor. Um, now I've got three monitors. I've got more cameras, more microphones, more lights. I've got my... Uh, audio mixer my video switcher so it's it's upgrade i'm still learning i'm still climbing that hill um hopefully within the next month or two i'm gonna i'm not necessarily master it to the point like i'm an auto audio visual uh professional but at least where i can handle everything here so we recorded sean webb um who is working with the monroe institute uh and his wow. number of books yeah um he was my first interview, in-house interview. And then he and I uh, drove up to uh, Nashville the last three days ago. We left on Monday. I came back Thursday morning and uh, interviewed with Sean Ryan. You know, Sean? How'd that go? How'd that go? Did, did you do it like an all-day thing with him? Or? Well, it was three, three and a half hours. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we started at, at, at 8.30. Well, we met for breakfast at 8.30. I think we started recording at 10. And then, you know, we took a couple of breaks and I think we finished around four, but we talked about a lot of stuff there. Yeah. I, I, I liked, uh, Sean a lot. He was, um, he was good, good interviewer. He li would ask good questions. We would listen. Um, yeah. And I just, I liked the guy. Uh, so uh, that should well, be. All that stuff must cost money. Where's the best place for people to support you? Is it Patreon? Is that the best place for now? Yeah. Yeah. And then so, remind you know the same the same old thing has been going on you know with Sacred Geometry International, since he's get starting to get called out now he's trying to go on the offensive and you know he's going online calling me a bunch of names and stuff. Yeah, yeah, me and him got in a fight. Yeah, we we had it out. Oh, really? Recently? Yeah, yeah he found he found my new Twitter account. I haven't blocked him. I've only muted him, so he might still be. He might still be yelling at me, but I can't see it, which is kind of how I like it. I don't like to block people. I like to mute them so that they don't know that I can't see them. Right, right. But, uh, yeah, we should mention that, that, of course, Sacred Geometry International does not support Randall in any way, shape, or form. Um, oh, you God, have to go to randallcarlson.com. I sell my work and monetizes my content, but I haven't seen a penny from any of it in going on five years now. And he posts a bunch of stuff that's total nonsense that I just want people to know that I'm not associated with the nonsense being posted by the web master on that. You site. are on Twitter again, though, right? It's I think it's Randall W. Carlson. Uh, hmm, good question. Well, if you go to RandallCarlson.com or HowTube.com, that'll get you. You'll find the links to all of that. Um, and yeah, I got the new website is going to be launched very soon. Laura Clapp has been working on it, but of course she got sidelined by a, what a month in Egypt. So um, I heard there's a rumor that you might, we might get you out to Egypt yet. Well, I've always wanted to get back there. I mean, two weeks was not nearly enough time to take it all in, but you know, I'm looking at a, uh, an Azores trip, an Atlantis trip. Um, and a couple of buddies of mine, uh, not Nick Spratt. I don't, you probably don't know. Him. Yeah. Yeah. He's there now. I talked to Nick. We're buddies. Yeah. Good. Cool. So Nick Spratt and Rob Reinhardt did Rob Reinhardt based on, uh, I think he was inspired by my Atlantis lectures and he went, um, last summer to, he spent like five weeks exploring Madeira, the Canaries and the Azores. So he came back from that. And then Nick Spratt, was talking to me, this is before Christmas, and that he was wanted to go explore the Azores. Um, again, kind of look for, you know, with the Atlantis connection. And I said, well, you know, my buddy, Rob Reinhardt has already been there. I should let you, I haven't been there yet, but I should get you in contact with him. So we had a Zoom meeting. Uh, I introduced the two of them and they ended up going to the Azores just recently, Gave, came back like a month ago. Um, yeah, that, that's right. I was looking at some pictures on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So they've been over there scouting uh, for setting up Atlantean tours. 
And some of the stuff they've found, ooh, let me tell you, some juicy, interesting stuff. And made some great contact. So I'm it's kind all of happening. And what? Yeah. And then if we can get it together after that, I wanted, you know, I did the Grail tour in 1989. And that was amazing. And I want to do a repetition of that. Some of the, now I did the, the Grail sites in, in, continental Europe. So I went, you know, from Chart to Amiens to Reims to um, to Montsegur to rennes la chateau to Ande to those sites. But then you've got all the sites up in the British Isles, which would comprise another segment of the Grail tour, hitting all of the sites that are associated with the Grail there, you know. Um, but that would be a very interesting tour to to undertake. Uh, so we should look at that as sometime in the in the future, but right now the Azores thing is looming large. You know they've, uh, uh, you know the flights now uh, fly directly. You can get there direct, of, right? Yeah, you yeah. don't have to go all the way over and back now. All the way over to Portugal and then back. Yeah. So well, so let the, me know. Keep us posted on that because that's something I want to come along on for sure. So. What you could do in the meantime is is start is read Plato's two dialogues because that's going to be our field guide. Timaeus and Critias, how cool is that? Yeah, so we should Plato, narrate those, guys. He, he gives the he gives the clues in there. So, um, so yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. So I guess that's about the main thing. Well, I'm sure they'll think of something else um, after we hang up. But yeah, so um, definitely in the in the can is the Scablands tour the Earth Origins Conference, the Cosmic Summit Conference, and the, the, the Gorge. I should mention that the Gorge is part of the Great Pacific Northwest Floods Tour. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's going to be great. People can get that over at contact at the cabin.com. I think there's about six or seven spots left. It's selling out fast. So if people want to come on that scab lines trip in May, uh, do not hesitate to get a spot other than that randall this has been fantastic it never gets old thank you very much for coming back on the show. quick question uh, have you are we reserving the soap lake lodge again for this yes. one yeah they are okay yeah cool. and it's they got a new breakfast thing going on we're changing up a little bit this time so we're not going to go all the way to soap lake the first day okay we're just going to go to the casino the first night checking out the casino by the airport head out have dinner and then head out to watch the sunset at uh um butte Epto butte head back to the casino stay the night there and then do the falls and everything as we make our way to soap lake got it oh that's it right. about four hours of driving out uh -huh, okay so. and we'll have the we'll have the comfortable passenger vans with the view viewing windows and yeah lunches right. picnic lunches We'll have some jams in the night. We'll have some presentations. It'll be, they just keep getting better. So if people want to check that out, contact at thecabin.com. Um, other than that, Randall, we'll let you get back to that intro so you can get this yeah. new podcast out because I'm sure people will be pretty stoked to hear. Yeah, uh, I'm stoked to be doing it. All right, gentlemen, as All always, right, it's been a pleasure and an honor and a lot of fun. Thanks, buddy. All right, awesome. man. We'll see you in a couple weeks, a couple months, yeah. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Maybe in a couple of weeks. Maybe in a couple of weeks. Can't rule it out. Can't rule it out. All right. So I'm going to click the little red button. All right. Ciao. Bye. And that was a chat with Randall Carlson. What'd you think? Oh, yeah. That was a classic Randall. But, well, I mean, it was Did good. We got into it a little bit. Did you do your moon background to try and just instigate some moon teasers? No. Did I? Did it seem like it? Well, it worked. We got so that's further into the moon than we've managed to get with them yet. And I yeah. can tell you from experience off the record, it gets a lot deeper than that. I mean, people could check it out on their own. You know, the great book to start with is Who Built the Moon. I mean, well, I mean, you know what's interesting is maybe now he'll do it now that he has his own podcast and he can do it on his own time a little bit without scheduling four other guys in there or three or four other people. That maybe now he because 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 with with the the derailment of NASA's mission and all that because he was NASA. waiting for that now yeah, now right. maybe yeah. he can just maybe he should just do it like a a three part presentation just get it out on video for everybody yeah. you know? absolutely hey if you liked our little podcast here if you're getting some value from these podcasts we put out these shows we put out 
for free, 600 and some episodes now. Go America.ca slash support, guys. Uh, it's real important that you send us, you know, we're on YouTube. We can't make any money here. We're we're banned. We can't get super chats anymore. Um, we're demonetized, but you can over to, head over to grimerica.ca slash support. You can sign up for a monthly. You can make a one-time donation. That helps us keep coming out with these podcasts. Um, if you guys want some more free value, you can head over to adultbrain.ca where we've got 120 audiobooks. If you're a Spotify premium member in the U.S. or the U.K., you get those for free. You get all the audiobooks for free, and we get paid. Uh, a bunch of them are on Audible. If you just type in Adult Brain Publishing, they'll all come up. But you can get them for free as well on YouTube uh, with some ads in them. That supports us that way. And uh, there's a podcast where you can get them too at adultbrain.ca. Uh, the Grand America Outlawed podcast where we do controversial stuff. GrandAmericaOutlawed.ca another great way to support us where you can sign up for a membership over there um and that's all the sort of ways we can keep ourselves afloat here so that we can try and keep keep ourselves coming out with great content uh spam gram grammaramerica.com anything else to get to before we wrap this up no, i think that's it i think that's it all right spring is sprung in the great white north well, did you mention the eclipse event, the big eclipse event? Oh, yeah, again? we have the big eclipse event that it, Randall might have just teased that he might show up at. So a couple <laughs> of weeks, we're having a big eclipse event on the path. Of, we, how do we not mention the eclipse event on the eclipse? <laughs> uh, contact at the cabin.com. Hit that menu button at the top. Go to uh, Eclipse the Canyon, where we'll be having a music festival for two days and two nights before the eclipse and uh, partying. I think if you get the VIP, you get the two nights. The other one might be just the one. Uh, check it all out. It's all on the website. But basically, you're going to camp. We're going to have a stage. We're going to have some food trucks. And we're going to all watch the eclipse together uh, with us, the Brothers of the Serpent, Ben from Uncharted X, a bunch of other great people. I mean, I can't mention them all because if I start that, if I mention more, I'll have to mention them all, and I can't. Uh, but, I mean, sounds like someone just might hinted that I might see him in a few weeks, and that's the only place I'm going in the next few weeks. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week.